1967 was two years before, before Stonewall. So two years before there really was a modern gay rights movement, the idea that two women would even have the thought pop into their head in the world the way it was back then, that they could get engaged. You know, I, I don't think they had any realistic expectation that it would happen, but the fact that they would even have the idea is such an incredible fact. Uh, the truly heroic part of their lives, though, is what happened for the next 30-some years. So it's great to be here with you tonight, Robbie. Um, before we get into all the legal issues and the constitutional issues in United States versus Windsor, it would be great just to set the, the stage in terms of the people. I was hoping you could start, because you know, so much of what you write about in the book is turning questions of constitutional law into questions about people, the dignity of people. So can you set the stage and tell us about Edie Windsor and Thea Spire? Sure. So uh, my client, Edie Windsor, my wonderful now 86-year-old client, Edie Windsor, who called me on the way here. Uh, we, it was our fourth call of the day, so <laughs> it's about a relationship. Um, uh, met uh, her spouse, her late spouse, Thea Spire. Uh, some of these dates really never cease to amaze me. In 1965. Um, the story is that at least from Edie's perspective, uh, it was love at first sight. Uh, not really so, according to Edie on Thea's side. Uh, and Edie kind of pursued, not kind of, she did pursue Thea for a couple years and Thea ultimately relented. Um, and they got together. Um, and uh, this is one of the other truly incredible facts in this case. In 1967, um, as they were driving out to East Hampton for the weekend, uh, Thea pulled off over to the side of the road and said to her, look, you know, if we were to get engaged, uh, what would you do? Like, could you wear, Edie worked then at IBM, could you wear a diamond ring to IBM? And Edie said, no way, I could never do that. Because if I wore a diamond ring at IBM, everyone would say, who's the lucky guy? <laughs> and I can't answer that question. Um, for those of you I'm sure have all seen Edie's picture, uh, she's a beautiful woman today. She was a knockout back then. She, I shouldn't say it. She's still a knockout today, withdrawing your honor. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but she said, you know what? I think if I wore a circular diamond brooch, that would be okay. So Thea literally got down on her knees and pulled out a diamond brooch, uh, and they got engaged. Um, why is that fact? I mean, it's such a wonderful story. One of the things that's most amazing to me about it <clears throat> is 1967, was two years before, before Stonewall. So two years before there really was a modern gay rights movement, the idea that two women would even have the thought pop into their head in the world the way it was back then, that they could get engaged. You know, I, I don't think they had any realistic expectation that it would happen, but the fact that they would even have the idea is such an incredible fact. Uh, the truly heroic part of their lives, though, is what happened for the next 30-some years. Um, uh, several years into their relationship, Thea was diagnosed with a terrible form of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and over time, she lost use of her uh, legs and then her arms. By the time she, would die, she died, she was a, a quadriplegic. And Edie has said that that diagnosis happened to both of them. And they had a post-it on their refrigerator that said, Seize Joy. Uh, and they made sure that they did that. In fact, at the day that Thea died, uh, she had patience to see that day. She was still practicing psychology and they had to be told that she had passed away. Wow. Um, so they had really, you know, talk about the marriage vows and sickness and in health till death you part. I mean, this is a couple who lived that, right? Wow. So, so of course, when, when Thea died, it gave rise to this legal case because between uh, s uh, spouses married and recognized by the federal government, there wouldn't be tax on the passing of, of the money. But the United States, because of this Defense of Marriage Act, taxed that transfer, and that gave rise to this case. And you eventually got drawn in uh, as potentially someone to represent Edie Windsor. And you went over and you saw her in her apartment. But it wasn't the first time you'd been to that apartment. And I got to say, if you were writing a fiction <laughs> book, you could never get away with it's what true. you're going to tell us. It's true. But in nonfiction, you can do this because it's true. What happens? Fiction is never as good as reality. Never as good as reality. So Tell us. It's truly an incredible story. So they went on. They lived their lives together. Thea passed away in 2009. And as Eric said, she got hit with this huge estate tax bill that really was a bill, a tax on being gay. Um, and she went looking for lawyers. And she was turned down by some groups. And through mutual friends, she was given my name. 
And when I got the phone call, um, I knew exactly, I had never met her, but I knew exactly who she was. And the reason that I knew exactly who she was is about 18 or so years before that, uh, when I was in my third year of law school, um, I was, I think it would be fair to say, a late bloomer when it comes to gay issues. Um, I had had all kinds of concerns and thoughts in my head, but I really uh, had not screwed up the courage to act on them until the bitter end of my third year in law school. And uh, my parents came to visit me in New York City. I was at Columbia Law School, but they came to visit me. I had a one room studio apartment on the Upper West Side. And it was my bad luck, or bad planning, or both, that it just so happens that it was Gay Pride Weekend. <laughs> and coming to my apartment, my parents had to kind of snake their way through the parade. Uh, and by the time they got to their apartment, they were in a mood, to say the least. Um, and uh, they started to talk, my mom in particular, about criticizing the parade. I don't know why anyone would be pride, proud of it. Uh, one of my roommates here from Harvard, her mother, who was an elected official in New York, marched in the parade. And my mom said, what is Ruth Messinger doing marching in that parade? And it went on and on. At a certain point, I said, stop, enough. Um, and she continued, and I said, stop, enough. And she, then she said, are you gay? Um, and I said, yes. And her reaction was not exactly ideal. Uh, <laughs> she walked over to the corner of the apartment and literally started hitting her head against the wall. Um, actually, it was one of the saner moments of my life, because I didn't know what to do other than I left my own apartment. Um, <laughs> but during that summer, as you can imagine, I was pretty down. Um, and I was moving to Boston. I clerked in, for a federal judge here in Boston. I was moving to Boston. And I started asking around. I thought I need to see a psychologist. And I said, I need to talk to someone who's good on gay issues. But that's the way you talked about it back then, good on gay issues. Uh, and the name I kept getting was Thea Spire. So I actually saw Thea Spire as a patient uh, two times, because again, I was moving. Um, in the same apartment, Thea was already paralyzed at that point. So in the very same apartment where Edie was living when she called me in 2009. Um, and here's the really cool thing about it. You know, I think it's unusual. I, I'm no shrink, but I, but I think it's unusual for psychologists to speak about themselves uh, during the sessions. But with me, Thea actually did speak about herself. She talked about Edie quite a lot. Uh, looking back on it, I think the reason she did that is she knew that I was kind of a tough customer. Uh, and that I was very dubious that I would ever be able to have a life with love in it and a family and emotional support. And I think she thought the only way she could convince me that that was so is by telling me about her own life. So she talked about this wonderful partner she had who was Edie Windsor. She talked about her being a math genius. She kept emphasizing Edie is a math genius. She'd gone, gotten her master's degree in math at NYU. But she kept talking about that. Flash forward, and that's all I ever saw of Thea. I, I would always look for her. During the gay pride parade, she'd be standing outside her apartment or sitting outside her apartment, and I would see her, but I, we never spoke after that. Flash forward to 2009. Uh, when I got the call from media, I knew exactly where to go, obviously. <laughs> I said, I'll see you at your apartment. And I walked in, and first of all, the first shock was all those emotions came right back at me. You know, these feelings that I hadn't experienced in 20-some years came right back. It was like going back to the scene of an accident. Um, and second of all, I had had this image of Edie as kind of being a woman with kind of like a slide rule, uh, flannel shirt, <laughs> uh, thick glasses. I mean, it's not only my image of mathematicians, it's probably my own internalized homophobia back in 1991, right? <laughs> and so when I opened the door and I saw everyone knows what Edie looks like, I almost fell over. And I said to her, look, you're not exactly what I expected. Uh, I've been here before. Let me tell you the story. Uh, and that's how we first met. Wow. <laughs> so the way your life weaves into this story is such an amazing part of the book. So of course, you're not out at that point, And you're going off into the legal profession. And you end up, through a series of coincidences and accidents, playing a really seminal role in what was one of the most important cases in New York about the ability of an unmarried single parent, or unmarried parent, to be able to adopt the child of the birth parent to whom they should be married or are living with. And how did that happen? This is, again, a remarkable case, because it's going to come back to reflect your own life yeah. not so long thereafter. So this was 1996. I had a second clerkship for the ch who was then the chief judge of New York, Judith Kay, an, an amazing judge. 
Um, and I was working for her, and during the clerkship, we got a case. We didn't get that many huge cases, but one of the big cases we got that term <coughs> was a case about whether essentially gay people should have the right to adopt in New York. Now, I was totally closeted at the time. Um, I was always worried that Judge Kay knew I was a lesbian, but she has since confirmed she had no idea that I was a lesbian. <laughs> and as I was working on this case, you know, and I got assigned to it, you know, it was constantly in my head, oh my God, maybe she knows. I, I thought I had this crazy theory that she was getting, it might have been true actually, to be honest, that she was getting memos from another judge that were pretty homophobic and that she was hiding them from me. Um, I think she was doing that, but I don't think it was because she thought I was gay. I just didn't think she wanted me to go crazy when I saw the memos. Um, but there was this intense case, and when, and when the vote first came down, the Court of Appeals in New York had seven judges, and of course in cases it's all about the votes. Uh, and when the vote first came down, it was four votes the other way and three votes to allow gay couples to adopt. And the only disagreement, it wasn't a substantive disagreement, but the only disagreement I've ever had with Judge Kay is that I persuaded her to hold that case over the summer. It was a, it's an unusual thing for an appellate court to do. And she said to me, well, why? You know, we're going to have to write the dissent. We're not going to get the fourth vote. And I said, it's not about getting the fourth vote. I did a little bit of advocating there. I said, I don't really think we can get the fourth vote. I thought we did, but I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, but we have all this other stuff going on. We can write a better dissent than we're writing. You need to give us time to write the best possible dissent. And she agreed. To her great credit, she agreed. Uh, and took a lot of flack from the other judges. And during the summer, we got the fourth vote. Uh, and when I got a call from the woman who was crooked for the other judge, I was in her office, and I started screaming like a wild banshee. Uh, and uh, Judge Kay was presiding over a, a meeting of all the judges, appellate judges in New York, and they said, what's going on? And Judge Kay said, oh, that's just my clerk, Robbie. <laughs> I'm sure it's, not, it's nothing. She'll let me know later. And you didn't just get that fourth vote. Uh, by chance, you worked that for I vote. worked that. I did what you would call, I think it would be fair to call it lobbying. Uh, yeah. I, I, did, I did some serious lobbying uh, for that vote, and we managed to get it, and, and it was the right thing to do. And, and that's what all those years later, I mean, allowed many, many gay couples to adopt in New York. And ultimately, when I adopted my son, it was pursuant to that, that case. The case is called Matter of Jacob v. Da and Dana. And your son, but coincidentally only, Jacob. It's Jacob. It's, that's after my gra uh, Rachel's uh, grandfather. As you <laughs> note in the book, it is not after <laughs> not the about, case. I'm sure Judge Kay thought it was about the case, <laughs> yeah. but it's really about Rachel's grandfather. Just amazing. I mean, just the way that the, the stories are all interwoven. So, so now, okay, we've, we, we've got to that point, but then there's an awful lot in between to get to this case, Windsor. And so some of the landmarks here in Massachusetts, of course, we're very aware and very proud of Goodrich. And uh, you know Margaret Marshall and, and what she did in Goodrich, and yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what that meant across the gay community, the legal community? What what role it plays as a turning point in everybody's thinking? It, it's hard to overstate uh, uh, Goodrich. It, it's it, in my view, in American history, it's a singular act of judicial courage. Uh, what Margaret Marshall did, um, you know, again today we read Goodridge and we think, of course, this is right, this is obvious. It makes sense to say that gay people should be treated like everyone else and they form families and are part of our community. In 2003, that was not uh, what was commonly thought, even in Massachusetts. Uh, and she knew, there's no question, that <laughs> Justice Marshall knew the reaction that she would get. Um, and it really was an incredible act of bravery, not only for, for Justice Marshall, but for Mary Bonato, uh, who when she brought that case, I've since asked her this, and I said, now that this is all over, Mary, and we've won all this, did you tell people that you were gonna be doing these cases? Did you tell the other gay groups that you were gonna go do this? And she said, no, I kind of kept it a little quiet <laughs> until we filed the case. So even then, uh, it was an incredible act of foresight and bravery, uh, and it changed the paradigm. Did it take Justice Marshall being a South African to really do that? I mean, she writes in that with an obvious comparison to race. And as a South African and seeing injustice right up in front of your face, I wonder whether someone standing outside was able to do this in a way you might not otherwise. Yeah, now, I, I suspect that if you were, I think I've seen her answer this question directly. I think if you asked her directly, she would not say that I, I did this because of my experience in South Africa. But, you know, I want to say a really radical concept. Judges are human beings, too. Uh, and, and they're all influenced by their backgrounds and their past and their, what they learned growing up and their ethical views. 
Uh, and there's no question that had an influence on her. Um, interestingly, the way that uh, African American civil rights and gay civil rights also went on their own kind of journey and relationship together. Uh, back in 2003, people were very, very reticent, and, and justifiably so, of comparing uh, gay civil rights issues to African American civil rights mm -hmm. issues, and there was a lot of understandable kind of discomfort with that. Some understandable, some not so understandable in the African American community. Uh, flash forward to today, and it's a completely different world. You know, I brought this case in Mississippi this last year. There was an African American judge, and I again was very careful about not making the analogy, and he kept bringing it up. He mm -hmm. kept comparing my case to Brown and bringing up the history, the legacy of the civil rights struggle in the South. Wow. So with that decision in Massachusetts, one thing changes amazingly, which is the concept of gay marriage is no longer an abstraction. And all of the parade of horribles of how society is going to fall apart if you allow gay marriage, Massachusetts puts the lie to it. And it seems to me, you know, reading your book, that the ability to point to the fact that the sky doesn't actually fall is really very important in this whole thing. Absolutely right. I mean, I argued the New York marriage case, which I lost uh, in 2004. And I remember at the argument, there were a lot of questions about what's going to happen if we roll you away, Ms. Kaplan, what's going to happen? And, and my answer was exactly what you just said, Eric. Nothing. Nothing <laughs> will happen if you roll my way. There's no, there's no rioting going on in the streets of Massachusetts. It's no big deal. Nothing will happen. But people were still scared of that then. Um, the other incredibly important thing about Goodrich is that a, people saw that people getting married, our marriages are just the same, for better or for worse, as anyone else's. And two, um, it created the circumstances where DOMA came into play. Because yeah. DOMA, when DOMA was passed, it was purely a hypothetical statute. It was passed in 1996. And basically what Congress said in 1996 is, if in the future any state decides to recognize gay marriage, it will be void under federal law. No state was close to recognizing gay marriage in 1996. There were kind of glimmerings in Hawaii, but they were really only glimmerings. And Congress passed this law. But then now that gay people are getting married, you have an issue. Because they have what Justice Ginsburg called skim milk marriages. They're married under Massachusetts law, and they're unmarried under purpose of federal law. And that's what created, created our case. Yeah. Now, one other element that seems to, to play an important role here is this case Lawrence v. Texas. That the Lawrence case, um, well, tell us about the Lawrence case and what role that plays in setting up the arguments and setting up Justice Kennedy. Sure. Goodrich could never have happened even without Lawrence. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, before Lawrence, uh, the Supreme Court had said in a case called Bowers uh, in 1986 uh, that it was perfectly OK to have laws that essentially criminalized being gay, right. that, that sexual relationships between gay people can be criminalized and that there was no problem. And I forget exactly the language, but the language in the majority opinion something says it's not even a serious question, yeah, actually, is yeah. what they said, to assume that there's a constitutional problem. Um, I'm very proud that my co-counsel uh, in the uh, Windsor case, Pam Carlin, the great professor at Stanford Law School, was clerking for Justice Blackman, who wrote the dissent in Bowers. And actually, he said before he died that she worked very hard on the, on the dissent in Bowers, which laid the groundwork for Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence was basically the same case in 2003. Uh, this time, we have Kennedy in the mix. And the Supreme Court in Lawrence basically said, look, when we decided Bowers, we were wrong then, and it's wrong now. And that's pretty rare. The court doesn't say that. Very so. rare for the court to say that. And it was, after an earlier decision in Romer, it was part of the, what was then the great Kennedy triumvirate of kind of developing uh, gay rights law. No justice has dominated an area the way Justice Kennedy has dominated this area. He's written every major gay rights decision. And this was kind of a further step uh, in his thinking. And again, Goodrich couldn't have happened. If you can criminalize being gay, right. it's pretty hard to say gay people have a constitutional right to get married. Right. So these both happen around the same time. Yes. And Kennedy comes in. And this concept of dignity is, is evolving here in this. But there's also somebody else who we'll come back to in a moment who's probably the, the most prescient of the lot in predicting <laughs> where this is all going to go. But we'll come back to him in, in just a moment. So all right. So we have the Windsor case. Um, you're at the apartment in just, just north of, uh, of the village Washington there, Square Washington Square Park. Um, and and you're, you're planning this case, and you'll take it up through the district court and the appellate court. And maybe in the interest of time, we won't go through all of those, but <laughs> it's the Supreme Court. Now, 
you're, you're already a very accomplished litigator, but you've never argued before the Supreme Court before. What was it like preparing to argue this case that wasn't just, I mean, it was on behalf, obviously, of a very important client, but it was something that was so important and so personal to you and so many people around you. What was it like to prepare this case? I would not say it was a stress-free, I'm not known as being a stress-free person to begin with, but I would not say this is a stress-free period of my life. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I was very aware of the pressure on me uh, in handling this case. Um, there's now kind of a group of lawyers that are known as the SCOTUS Bar, uh, call it about two dozen lawyers, who argue most of the main cases in the Supreme Court. About 70% of the major cases get argued by a member of this, of this SCOTUS elite bar. It didn't exist when I started to practice, but it, it's very important today. Uh, and I was concerned. I mean, I knew there were a lot of people out there, whether they said it explicitly or, or implicitly, that thought that a member of the SCOTUS bar should argue the case. Uh, and so pretty early when this started, I called up Pam Carlin and I said to her, look, I said, I want you to know I'm thinking about whether I should argue the case. And I want you to know uh, that if I don't argue the case, assuming that Edie agrees with my recommendation, I will recommend that you argue this case. I said, and Pam had done about nine arguments at that point. I said, given that, what do you think I should do? Uh, and to her enormous, I don't know, credit, naivete, I don't know what word you want to use, but uh, Pam didn't hesitate uh, and said that you should argue this case. She said, there are things about arguing in this court that are different in the Supreme Court, and she was right about that. She said, but you can learn them. It's not that hard to learn. And you know this case, and you should argue it. So we then went through this period of me learning how to argue in the Supreme Court, um, which includes these, what you call moot courts, where you have, we do formal and informal. And in the formal ones, you sit in front of a panel of six or seven uh, lawyers who pretend that they're the judges on the Supreme Court. Uh, their job is to beat the living you-know-what out of you for about 45 minutes. And then you spend about an hour and a half critiquing everything you've said. Uh, maybe root canal without anesthesia <laughs> would be more painful. Maybe, um, I don't know what, it was, it's pretty hard stuff. Um, and what, that's what we did. We practiced over and over and over again. And, and the one thing that I did have to learn that's different in the Supreme Court is you have very little time in a case like this. Um, and it's, in, in most appellate courts, in the intermediate appellate courts, it's usually much longer time, much more leisurely. You really have a time to try to persuade the judges, to try to kind of have an intellectual discussion. You, you had 15 minutes, 15 half minutes. of the time that you and I are going to talk here, to argue this entire, entire issue. case. And the judges, they know what they're, it's not like in a case like Windsor, they haven't made up their minds. You're not going to persuade them during your argument. So your job is very much to kind of help the justices on your side kind of argue in the argument with the justices on the other side. And it is different. Um, but after getting beaten up hundreds of times, I think I finally got it down. And, and you did get a lot of opinions from people conflicting in all sorts of ways. And, and then you, you planned your strategy through, and you get to the Supreme Court. Of all of this argument that's going on, can you give us any one particular exchange that you think captures the, the crux of the case, what really pushes it? I mean, I think of a couple of the I can give you two. Two. Uh, but neither of them were during my argument. Which, okay. is, which is pretty amazing, actually. So I was actually the last person to argue on the merits. I was actually the only gay person in two days of arguments, because the Proposition 8 case was the day before to argue on these issues. Um, and uh, Paul Clement, my adversary, got up first, because he had lost below. And pretty shortly into his argument, he was kind of talking about marriage and talking about the importance of marriage. And Justice Ginsburg interrupted him, and she said, look, uh, Mr. Clement, he said, for people like Edie Windsor, he said, you know, marriage is not just one little thing. It's not just this little tax sphere, and that's all it is. She said, it affects every part of your daily life, um, from benefits to health care to everything. It's, if your whole life is about marriage. She said, so what you're telling me is the marriages of people like Edie Windsor are really only like skim milk marriages compared to the marriages of everyone else. Um, but for people who have been in the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg does not speak that loudly. Um, I didn't actually hear what she had said. Um, I heard people laughing because it was kind of, it's, there's a mic in the back so the people in the back of the courtroom can hear. I didn't hear and I turned to Pam and I said, what'd she just say? And Pam said, she said, scheme of marriage. And I literally, I, I had to hold my arm down. I wanted to kind of do this. Uh, <laughs> and, and even I knew that that probably wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty good sign that things were, were, were looking good for us. 
Uh, and then a little bit later in the argument, um, Paul, and this is his job, this isn't a criticism, he was describing, trying to describe DOMA, and he wanted to say to the court that DOMA was just some ordinary statute. You know, it was no big deal. Uh, it was signed into law by President Clinton, passed by great majorities, which is true in, in the House and the Senate, and it was no big deal. It was as if Congress were just reappropriating money to the yeah. National Park Service, although today maybe that's not so ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kagan interrupted him, and she did, look, you know, if I ever have a choice about being cross-examined by Justice Kagan <laughs> or any other person on the planet, I will pick any other person it's on the planet. Right. <laughs> because she did a cross-examination that really they could teach in trial advocacy classes. I mean, it was unbelievable. And she basically said, look, Mr. Clement, she said, you're describing DOMA as if it's this ordinary statute. She's like, but doesn't it say in the House report in 1996 that it was being passed? based on moral disapproval of gay people? Isn't that what it says? And she was sitting there, she had it right there. Uh, and, and Paul is probably the most able Supreme Court advocate of my generation. He's a superb lawyer, but he was shaken. You could hear it. And he said, does it, I'll never forget it. These were the key words, I think, in the whole argument. He said, does it say that in the House report? Yes, it says that in the House report. And if that's enough to invalidate the statute, you should invalidate the statute. And it was. <laughs> And if you read Justice Kennedy's opinion, that's pretty much exactly what he did. <laughs> it was the crux right there, right? The, 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 the moral disapproval was not actually a valid rational reason. So did you know you were going to win? Look, I, you know, yes and no. I mean, I thought yes it had gone no. well. No, no, it had we gone thought, well. I, the minute after every argument when I do this thing, I kind of play back the cassette in my, in my head and to see if I should have answered anything differently. And I played it back, and I was feeling good. And I turned to Pam and I said, I think I answered it all okay. She said, you definitely did. And Kennedy was looking good. You know, we knew we had needed Kennedy's vote and he, we thought we had him. But look, you know, I'm an erotic lawyer. That's how I got to where I am. So <laughs> can I tell you that those three months between the argument in March and the decision in June, I mean, it, it was crazy. What I was, was it like? What would you do during I that I was time? completely insane. We went on a vacation. Rachel's nodding. We decided to go on a vacation to Italy to relax. I, I probably should have just taken the money and burned it in the fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> it was the least relaxing vacation I've ever no. taken in my life. And Edie was just as bad. So like we're having these phone calls. I'm on the Malfi Coast. And Edie and I are like ah. having these crazy phone calls with each other. Um, and then the Supreme Court does this thing that's a little bit, I, I'll go on a limb and say this, it's a little bit sadistic, um, <laughs> which is they don't tell people when your case is coming down. So you know when they're announcing cases, but you don't know which case it will be. So and Do Edie had been told that she couldn't travel to DC. So every time they had what's called a decision day, we would all gather in my apartment. We'd all be sitting around the dining room table uh, looking at laptops, which were on SCOTUS blog, waiting for the decision. Mm -hmm. And we had like three, at least three false starts. Um, each time, Edie got angrier and angrier and angrier. Uh, one of them is described in Arielle Levy's wonderful article in The New Yorker. I'm not going to quote what she said, but it's the first line of the article. You can read it for yourself. <laughs> um, Edie was not a happy camper. And then, they had no more cases to issue. The only two cases left were our case in Prop 8, so we knew that was the day. Uh, it was the last day. It was the right? last day. We were all really looking for three things. One was it going to be the first decision, because uh, we knew if it was, that means Kennedy had written it. People had all been speculating that the two decisions left were going to be written by Kennedy and Roberts. Uh, and call us crazy, we thought we were probably better off with Kennedy than Roberts. <laughs> uh, and uh, so those are the things we were looking for. And when it came across the screen, first decision of the day, decision by Justice Kennedy, and then dissent by Scalia. We didn't need to read another word. We knew that we had won. And, and it, there really was pandemonium in my apartment. I mean, I was screaming like a banshee. Rachel was crying like a banshee. Uh, Ariel Levy, who was supposed to be this objective reporter, was crying her eyes out. There's some great pictures of this. Uh, it was incredible. So OK, you've now uttered the word Scalia. The person, <laughs> the person who, I think, gets credit for the best predictive powers of anybody here. In the Lawrence case, he says, if you allow Lawrence, it's going to end up in gay marriage. And he's right. He Tell us about Scully. He says it again in Windsor. Yeah. And he's right. God, he's a good predictor of this. I, I and mean, he holds it up as this is something to fear. But he's very good at his prediction odds. Tell us about Scalia and his role in all this. You know, if you read the dissents in particular in Windsor, uh, particularly compare the dissents of the Chief Justice and Scalia, uh, 
at least in my view, you can tell that the Chief Justice is pretty irritated that Justice Scalia is basically predicting gay marriage based on Windsor. I mean, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts does not want that result. And you can tell he's kind of like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you saying that this is going to inevitably lead to Windsor? This is not a helpful thing for you to say. Um, and that really is, if you read it, that really is the tenor of their back and forth. Uh, but Justice Scalia, for whatever reason, I, you know, look, I'm sure there are things that we agree on. I, I know we, we both agree. <laughs> You I'm, can't think of any offhand. No, but no, that's... no, I can't. He has said that he believes that Chicago-style pizza is not really pizza. <laughs> and I completely agree with him on that. Totally. It's good to know there's common ground. And I'm that's sure good. there's even other common ground somewhere. Probably not about gay rights. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to his, his view, which he keeps saying over and over again, that the logic and language of Windsor was going to lead to Obergefell, and that the logic and language of Lawrence was going to lead to Windsor, he was completely right about that. He was. And so in Obergefell, it's preceded by all of these cases in the course of this two years after Windsor. And what half or more of them seem to quote Scalia, yeah. quoting the dissent for their result. Yeah, I'm, sure the chief, I'm sure the Chief Justice was it's not just, happy every time that happened. It's exactly why the Chief Justice didn't want exactly. this. And but somehow, Justice Scalia couldn't control himself from handing that line to the, anyway, you don't have to comment, counselor. That's all right. We both agree that Chicago style pizza, pizza is a real pizza. That's all I can say. So look, at least if you weren't sure you were going to win Windsor, surely Obergefell, was that in doubt to you at any point? Look, again. Other than a meteor striking Kennedy? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, that's the issue. I mean, it really is only a one judge margin. I mean, we're all talking, and it's incredible what we've accomplished. And it's incredible how the world has changed. But we also have to be realistic. It's, it all hangs on one vote. Yep. Um, you know, there was a lot of speculation in Obergefell that maybe we'd get a sixth vote. I didn't think we would. And, and it, we now know from the dissents that we weren't even close. Um, and during the argument, I attended the argument over the and I, they put me, it was just luck, I was very close to the, the judges, the justices, and I was laser focused on Justice Kennedy, as you can imagine, as everyone else was. Um, and he asked one question about the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire at the beginning that wasn't so great, uh, and everyone almost had a heart attack when they heard him ask that question. <laughs> but then he seemed to recover, and the rest of his questions were pretty good. So, so I thought, that we were going to win, but you know, I'm a very superstitious person. You don't want to uh, tempt the evil eye here. I don't want to tempt the fates. Right. So until you know, I saw that Scotus bug screen for the first, second time. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't counting. I wasn't counting any chickens. Probably a good practice, but uh, I think the way this all came down with the arguments in Windsor about dignity, it was hard, at least, to imagine. Although I had the same worries you did, but it seemed hard to imagine that it could rationally go any other way. So let me, let me just wrap up with, with one or two questions here, and then I think we're going to throw it open to the audience. What's next? What are the issues now? I mean, I've, it's hard to imagine something sweeping through as rapidly as this. It, the results seem perhaps to have exceeded the agenda in this. Yeah. What's next? So well, the one thing I think we know from Windsor and Obergefell is that the government, whether it's state, local, or federal, governments can't discriminate against gay people anymore. So that's why, you know, with this Kim Davis stuff, there's a lot of smoke. Um, it's like, could we have a better story for gay rights, by the way, than Kim Davis? I mean, she's the best <laughs> gift that we've had in years. First of all, you have her and her crowd and how horrible, you know, how unappealing it all is. <laughs> then you have the fact that she lies about meeting with the Pope. I mean, that's just, it's like it's like the you know the cherry on top of the cake. So the, the truth of the matter is every judge that's looked at the, the Kim Davis thing has said this is ridiculous. You know, no state official gets to choose which parts of the Constitution they're going to comply with. Um, gay couples are getting married in that county in Kentucky. That's, you know, people lose sight of that. So, you know, I think there's always going to be like these Andy Warhol, five minute of fame, I want to sound like a crackpot. Uh, and there will be that. <laughs> Not that that's Kim Davis, of course. There will be that. But I think that that issue is pretty resolved. And, and I yeah, think oh. the reaction to it is actually pretty clear that it's resolved. The other, if you go to the other side, then, it's what's going to happen with private businesses. And can private businesses say that they're going to not serve a customer? These are the so-called religious freedom restoration acts, which aren't religious. They're not about freedom, and they're not restoring anything. <laughs> but can, can a, a business say that they're not going to serve a customer because they're gay? Now, here I have a non-legal answer. And the non-legal answer is that no American business that wants to make money 
has any interest in having a store manager being able to say to someone, sorry, we're not serving you. We don't, we don't serve your kind That's here. Right. Uh, we, thank God, got rid of that in this country many years ago. Thank God it won't come back. And I don't really think there's any appetite uh, in the business community for it to happen. You will see, again, some one-offs like a bakery somewhere who doesn't want to bake a gay cupcake or whatever. Uh, but but I, don't, I don't predict that it's going to be I don't predict it's going to be a major issue. I just think that, that we've kind of settled this now. Um, we'll see what happens when I go down to Mississippi on November 6th. Hopefully I'm right about that. I, I feel like I'm jinxing myself as I speak. Uh, but I think we've pretty much settled it. And, and you know the issues will be in other areas. Tr the truth is we have major issues in this country with income inequality. We have major issues in this country with racism. Uh, and that's what we need to focus on, in my mind. Uh, not that we don't still have to fight these fights, but for the most part, I think we've won them. So since you've tied up that agenda pretty nicely, you and many people have worked together over a couple of decades, uh, let, me, let me just close with a more personal question. So the book is Then Comes Marriage, which is such a brilliant title. Um, first comes love, then comes marriage. And in the book, you write for yourself about love. Um, and when Windsor came down, uh, a reporter for the the um, the Beast, I think it was. Yeah. Asked. Thrasher. Right. Asked Edie Windsor, "What is love?" Can I ask you, what is love? Oh boy, I mean, love is what we were put on this planet for, right? Love is is what it's all about. I mean, life is hard. Um, I don't have to tell you, given what you do, that people. All kinds of bad things happen to us because of our genes and our environment and other people in our lives. Uh, and love is what makes life worth living. Here, um, here. Wow. At least in my view. Let's throw it open to the audience for questions. Speaking of Supreme Court Justice, uh, many of the dissents were somewhat apoplectic, but uh, <laughs> especially in the, you know, the Obergefell case, uh, the, the Roberts dissent was sort of treated as somewhat reasonable. I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing your uh, thoughts on that. I think. I think, actually, I think he was pretty mad, the chief. I, I think he, he's not happy that the law has developed this way. Uh, I, I think uh, he's not happy the way that Kennedy has dominated this area of the law the way that he has. Um, you, know, I, you know, certainly he didn't say the kinds of personal things about other judges that Scalia said in his dissent. Uh, but I, for, especially for the chief, I see it as a pretty harsh dissent compared to some of his other dissents in other cases. Um, I think he felt, you know, pretty upset about it. At least is my reading of it. Mm -hmm. First, I just want to say thank you for. Um, I'm getting married to my partner next year. Congratulations! I just, I just thank you so much. Um, I guess one, one of you mentioned, you know, sort of the uh, the smoke screen. We're going to see some of the, some of the backlash that we're going to see here and there uh, over the over health decision in particular and uh, same-sex marriage. But I, I see related to that um, the continuing uh, dissolution or dilution, I should say, of, uh, of women's right yeah. to to have abortion in this country being se severely curtailed through legal processes, through legislative processes. And I, I see them as related, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, because that certainly seems to be happening. I was actually on the phone with Gloria Steinem today, because we're speaking in New York uh, at an event next month, and we were talking about this, and she was saying that what's clear is that our enemies, we have our enemies in common, right? So the same people, which actually for gay people seems to be focused on the people who are uh, running to be the Republican presidential nom nominees, uh, are they seem to be the only people who care about this anymore, but they're <laughs> totally focused on this incredibly kind of nutty anti-gay agenda. They're also focused on this incredibly nutty anti-Planned Parenthood agenda. They're also focused on this, we're going to shut down all the driver's license bureaus in the South so no one can register to get to vote. Yes. Uh, so we have our enemies, there's no question that we have our enemies in common. Um, I have spent a lot of time, and I don't have the answer to it, thinking about how is it that we've accomplished so much so rapidly with respect to gay rights, um, and why hasn't the same thing happened in other areas? Now, I can answer it. I know the answer for gay rights. I don't know the answer for why it hasn't happened in other areas. For, for, and Pat Williams, who's sitting here, probably does. But for, for gay rights, I think the answer is that people came out. It's, it's that simple. You know, Edie on the steps of the Supreme Court said, one day some brave person got up in the morning and said, I'm gay. 
and then another, and then another. And so by the time we got to, well, there's a great story about Lawrence, that when the justices, they, they, they're initially behind like a red velvet curtain. And the curtain opens. And when the justices kind of came out and sat down, the entire bar section of the Supreme Court that day was pretty much full of gay former Supreme Court clerks. Uh, and according to the legend, I've heard this from a lot of people, that Justice O'Connor in particular was kind of like, like, oh my god, I didn't know he was gay. Oh my god, I didn't know he was gay. Um, and that is what's changed things. I mean, by this point, you know, Justice Scalia says he has friends who are gay. I'm sure he does. Um, every justice knows someone who's gay, and that's what changed their views. Now, why we can't have that same empathy about women's you know, re reproductive freedom or African-American civil rights, I, I, I wish, I mean, that's the challenge that's facing our country. I was wondering, uh, as a layperson, I'm not a lawyer, how, how the process works to pick the right case to bring forward in such a high profile mm. subject and such a public event. I'm kind of an old fashioned lawyer in the sense that I don't pick cases, clients pick me. Uh, and so uh, I basically, Edie, what happened is when Edie had to pay this tax bill, she, to use her words, she was indignant. You don't have a lot of clients who use words like indignant excuse me, that she had to pay it. And so she went around looking for a lawyer. Uh, and she went to some other groups and they turned her, excuse me, they turned her down. Uh, and so we had a mutual friend and the mutual friend said, would you give her a call? And I did. Uh, and you know, I went to her house and I took one look at her uh, and heard her story about Edie and Thea's life together, the discrimination that they both had encountered uh, as gay women even before they met, um, the tax aspect of it. I, I thought it was perfect. Um, and you know, on top of that, she's this charismatic, beautiful woman, which doesn't really hurt. Um, I thought it was perfect, but a lot of people didn't agree with me. There were a lot of people at that time who thought that uh, Edie uh, would be perceived as too privileged because it was a three hundred some thousand dollar tax bill. Uh, that she, that Americans wouldn't get it. They would see her as having this specialized problem that Americans didn't face. I didn't think that. I thought, first of all. The estate tax was really just because her apartment had appreciated in value like any New Yorker's apartment over the years, um, number one. Number two, Americans hate taxes. Uh, we all hate taxes, and everyone gets in their gut what it means to have to pay an unfair tax. Um, I think here in Boston, people know that best of all. I think that's what started our country. Um, and uh, even the Republicans didn't like the estate tax. So as far as I was concerned, it was the perfect case. And, and having to pay that much money really showed the damage uh, of what was at issue here. So I thought it was good for that reason, too. Could you talk a little bit about um, employment non-discrimination and non-discrimination in housing? Because we hear over and over again in places outside of Massachusetts, you know, you can get married on the weekend and on Monday walk into work and be promoted or fired, um, you could be kicked out of your apartment, some of those other issues. So there are a bunch of states, Massachusetts, New York, where it's against the law of discrimination against gay people, period. That's easy. Um, there are states that don't have those laws. And the EEOC uh, has now taken the position that uh, firing a person in a state that doesn't have a non-discrimination law because they're gay violates Title VII, that it's gender discrimination, um, and it's illegal. Uh, that issue has to get litigated in the courts. Uh, it will be litigated, but uh, at least it's the position of the EEOC uh, that private employers still can't fire anyone today because they're gay. But Better than having to litigate that in the courts, the better solution is having a statute that says that. Uh, so there's a, a bill now pending in Congress called the Equality Act that would solve the problem. Um, I don't have to tell you there's not a lot of momentum in Congress right now to get it or anything else done. Um, but so that's kind of the lay of the land. To be honest, again, I don't. You're not seeing a lot of these cases because I think employers who put up like the Catholic Church scenario because there you do have a religious issue, but. Uh, non-religious employers, I don't think anyone's dumb enough now, even if they want to, to say I'm firing you because you're gay, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're not seeing a lot of clear cases like that. I'm sure it's happening. It's just there's much more of a pretextual situation. Which leads us to the Davis situation. So it looks like uh, Cutler Jones is the issue. When you get to the, to the morality piece of it, it's not so slammed up. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts or comments that you might offer. Yeah, look, I think for a public servant, it's pretty slam dunk. I mean, I, public servants don't have, they, she, can not, she can follow her conscience. She just can't be the clerk of that county. Yeah. That's fine. 
Uh, but that's the way the system works. And if you actually read Scalia's decision in the case, the Peyote Indian case that led to the original RIFRA in Congress, he basically said that, that, that government officials and governments can't be in the business of allowing these kinds of distinctions, particularly when they impact other people. Um, so I don't think that the argument for her really has any weight at all. I think the harder argument is kind of the Hobby Lobby version. If you have a small, mm. it's not so small, but you have a big <coughs> private company and the owners of the company don't really care about who they offend and they want to say, you know, we're not going to allow employees here who are, who are married, who are gay or something like that because it offends our religion. That's the issue that's ultimately going to have to get litigated in the Supreme Court. I, I think we'll win it. Um, and it may not even get litigated in the context of gay rights. It could easily get litigated in the context of contraception. Mm -hmm. uh, probably more likely in to get context. litigated in that context. So uh, this discussion about the religious position, the conversation with people who hold strongly, strong religious beliefs, reminds me of something right at the end of your book. A day or two after Windsor comes down, you're at your temple and you're giving a drash, you're giving a, a talk on a particular part of the, the Bible here. And I had never heard the story before of Zelophehad yep. and, and Zelophehad's daughters. Yep. Could you tell us that? Because the notion, I, I find this notion that the Bible has a story that tells us you should be able to challenge biblical statements and biblical laws, and that's to be encouraged. And, God will relent in the face of a good argument. I think it's a, it's a striking thing. And the fact that you're giving this drosh at the temple a couple days afterwards, tell us the story of this. Because it might be common ground for, for conversations with, with some people who come from a religious position. So it was, it was great timing. Um, well, first of all, looking back up, I, I was obsessed with the religious stuff in this case. I think one of the mistakes that our movement has made or made in the past is to cede the religious arguments to the other side. Uh, so there was this perception in our country, and still is, that uh, religious views on gay people are anti-gay. Um, that's not true. There are many, many religious groups in this country who believe that regardless of what they think about having the sacrament of marriage, they believe that every single human being was created in the image of God. And if every human being was created in the image of God, then we all have dignity. And certainly as a matter of civil law, I actually think this is what influences Justice Kennedy in part, Certainly as a matter of civil law, that dignity has to be respected. So one of the things I did in the case is I was obsessed with having mainstream religious groups on our side. Um, and we worked really hard on this. And Amy's sister, my dear friend, Rabbi Jan Erbach, uh, was the secret lobbyist uh, to get the conservative Jewish movement for the first time ever in its history to submit an amicus brief and to submit it on our side. And look, I have no idea if it mattered at all, but I have to think that Justice Kagan and probably Justice Ginsburg at least noticed uh, that that brief had been filed. I bet. Um, so, the, so it just so happened that the weekend in, in Judaism, you read a portion of the Torah, the, the original, the Old Testament, every week. And it just so happened that the week, weekend after we won, the parsha that you read that weekend is a story about the daughters of Zlofahad. And the daughters of Zlofahad were five daughters. Uh, he died without a male heir. Uh, and under the inheritance rules that applied among the Israelites, the Jews at the time, they were to be disinherited. Um, and they pled their case to Moses and said, this is unfair. We, this, our father's name and his assets should not go to these other relatives. We should get it. And according to the Torah, Moses then pled the case to God. And God said, you're right. I'm changing the law. <laughs> Even though I said in the past that they can't inherit, I'm changing it, they can uh, so was this so original intent did not rule there. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, so it was an incredible, you know, the people had this view that religion means that people can't change, or, the con or certain views of the Constitution mean that nothing can ever change. And that's not at least my view of religion, and it was this wonderful thing to have happen at that time. Uh, Robbie, it's so wonderful to talk to you about this. Thank you so much for everything you've done for all of us. And for everybody who wants to buy a copy of the book, there's lots of copies of Then Comes Marriage back in the back. But Robbie, thank you so thank much. You. Nations are disappearing. People are dying. 
Mass extinction is unfolding. And all of it sooner and faster than science predicted. The window in which to prevent the worst scenarios is closing before our eyes.